The Deer Farming Channel is brought to you in part by Record Rack Deer and Elk Feeds. As a deer hunter, I want to know all I can about America's favorite big game animal. That's why I became a deer farmer. Without deer farms, we lose our greatest resource for research and whitetail management. With them, we gain more knowledge than ever before. Join me as we discover the truth about whitetails and meet those who work every day to preserve this great species for future generations. My name is Keith Warren and this is Deer and Wildlife Stories. It's the first week of August. There are sunflowers everywhere and they're about three weeks away from being fully grown and so are the white-tailed deer. Hi everybody, I'm Keith Warren. Welcome to the show and to Ohio where today we're at X-Factor Whitetails. I fell in love with deer farming about 15 years ago and didn't get my own deer until a little over 10 years ago. But I'll tell you, I, I was like a sponge. I was listening to everybody in the industry. And there was one name that kept coming up over and over again. As far as this guy, uh, he was from the Midwest and he was growing some big deer and his name is Russ Beller. I'm Russ Beller. I'm with X Factor Whitetails of Ohio. I've been a deer farmer for 25 years, started in 1990, and uh, I just love to see those antlers grow. The reason I got into deer farming, I, was, I bought a piece of property in Alberta, Canada uh, 25 years ago, 26, and uh, those farmers up there was raising some white-tailed deer, and I thought I could do that in Indiana where I lived. I had a piece of property that had 3,200 acres with it, and I took 1,700 and fenced it and built a nice lodge and, and started raising deer and I've been hooked on it ever since. It takes three years to raise a, to raise a deer, to, to harvest that deer at, at three years old. Uh, if you took a cow and bred a cow, it takes three years to get a cow and a calf to the market and today is the highest price ever, ever for cattle. You might get $1,500. For the same animal, deer, you could generally get around ten to 15000 for him. Which one you'd rather have, 15000 or 1500 And a deer eats seven times less feed than a cow. The cool thing about white-tail deer farming is that you don't have to have a big piece of property to do it. It doesn't take a whole lot of money to get into it. And especially when you've got a business model like Russ Beller has here. Uh, Russ isn't chasing the breeder market. And, and what we mean by that is chasing the breeder market. There's some exceptional big deer out there. And there's some people making an exceptional pile of money off the breeder market. But you know what? Russ has decided, like you would probably decide if you were going to get in the deer farming industry, to not chase the breeder market, but be in the production side of things. And so literally, you can get some semen off some exceptional bucks like X Factor for a very good price and put it in your does and you're producing some animals that, well, if you're gonna compare those animals to the animals on the outside, the free range animals, uh, they're probably better than 95% of the, of the free range animals out there and that would be in the production side of the business so you could actually farm those animals, 
find people that have preserves, game preserves like this, and be able to, to be a supplier. The Deer Farming Channel is brought to you in part by New Dart, leading the industry in accuracy. All right, so how old are these guys, right? Oh, those two smaller ones there, are, one's a yearling, one's a two-year-old. Those other bucks there are all three-year-old. How many of them go back to X Factor? Every one of them has got either grandsons or sons of X Factor. You know, I can look at some of them and, and just from, I mean, if you were to take the antlers off of them, I can look at them and actually see X Factor in, in their face. I mean, the, the way their faces are shaped. I mean, there's a big one over there. He's got a flyer off of his left side. Whew, that's a pretty deer. Well, he puts a lot of nice bucks out there. I've had some as high as uh, 600 inches out of him. Out of X Factor? Yes, out of X Factor. Well, I know that, you know, I'm, I'm looking at these deer in general, and, and, I, and I think, you know, X Factor had a lot of non-typical stuff on him. And I mean, the older he gets, of course, a lot of these deer, the more non-typical they're gonna go. But when X Factor was in a, his prime, he was, I mean, he was big framey, and he, I thought he was one of the most beautiful deer ever. But I'm looking at these guys, I'm thinking, there's a lot of typical frame deer in here. I mean, sure, they got some flyers and some little trash off their points, but for the most part, it really surprises me that X Factor winds up throwing something so clean. X Factor generally throws 80% uh, of those bucks out of X Factor looks like that. I've only had about 10% that looked like he was, that was palmated and, uh, and have all the junk that he had. Well, why do you why do you think that? You know, I don't know. He, you know, he came from a background of some very good typical bucks. Mm-hmm. Well, some of these deer right here, I, and, and looking at them, I mean, they're the. This is the thing that blows my mind. You come up to, I mean, I'm from Texas, and I see Texas deer that are 225 pounds. Well, these deer right here, tell everybody how heavy these deer are. Ah, uh, they'll go around 300. 280 to 300 generally. I, we uh, got a scales when we have to run run them in to work on them. About 310 is the highest we ever get one. And so when you take a look at the antlers on these guys, proportionally, I mean, that's, that's, I mean, they look big. You know, I mean, you're looking at an animal that's 280, 300 pounds. I mean, yes, the antlers look big, but I think until you actually hold the antlers in your hand, that's when you really can't imagine how big they are. Well, X Factor, we cut him because uh, it gets too big to carry sometimes, and we cut him. They the most they've ever weighed was 32 pound. For the antlers. Antlers, just the antlers, 32 pound. Oh my gosh! And so, as, as a deer farmer, I mean, yes, we're we're interested in growing big deer. We want the biggest antlers we can get, but we also want to push the biggest bodies too. You've got to have the body to carry that rack. Well. I'm sitting here looking at these guys and I'm thinking they are beautiful. It's really a surprise to me to see how clean they are coming out of X Factor. I mean, I'm, I, I'm impressed because I like clean looking deer like this, but, but one thing that I'm noticing out of these deer, they're exceptionally calm. But when these deer are released then, again, they're not gonna be calm like this. No, 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 no. You take them off that feed when they go back to eating natural grass and stuff like that, they, they'll, be just as, they'll be just like a regular deer. Well, you talk about feed. I know that uh, you've got a ton of sunflowers planted around the property. And like you said, you make your own feed. How important do you think those sunflowers are to producing the kind of deer that you're producing here? Oh, I think it's a key to it, uh, to have the sunflowers. Sunflowers, I have my nutritionist tell me all the stuff that's in these sunflowers and the vitamin E and the C and the E and everything is just unbelievable. Well, this is amazing. I mean, I'm just looking at these guys and going, I mean, it's uh, right now, we're the first week of, or of uh, August right now, first week of August. So how much more growing do you think they have to do? I think they've got another three weeks. Some of them has got another three weeks. Well then, okay, and I'm looking at them. Most of them are nice typical frame. You got a few of them in there that are non-typical. Uh, there's a couple in there that uh, actually in that group that, I mean, they're real non-typical. What, what is that from? You think they're from antler damage or genetics? Oh, a little bit of genetics. I, I, we only got one in here that's got antler damage. Uh, he hurt that is uh, when he shedded the antler. Um, 
and I think that's what it was. Well, there's some big old deer, that's for doggone sure. Well, if somebody wants more information about deer uh, and what you do, how do they get a hold of you, Russ? Oh, they get a whole, go to our website. We got X Factor Whitetails of Ohio, and they can see everything, everything we do there. Okay, all righty. Man, I really like that guy right there. Mm hmm The Deer Farming Channel is brought to you in part by Record Rack Deer and Elk Feeds. All right, so these guys, how old are they? They're, some of those are one-year-olds and two-year-olds is, is uh, this crop here. Yeah, you can just tell by looking at them that they're, they don't have the age on them across the board that the other ones do. But I mean, there's some big deer in here. You know, Russ, I look at some of these and I think, you know, these are turnout deer, okay? Right? Every one of them is a turnout deer. Every, every one here is turnout. Mm -hmm. and, and so, but you've been deer farming for 25 years. Yes. Okay? Mm -hmm. And would you have thought 25 years ago that you're going to be turning out some of these deer right here you'd have loved to have as a breeder years ago? Well, uh, five years ago, there's a lot of them in there. <laughs> a lot of people would love to have as a breeder. The breeding has really exploded in the last five years. It, the You know, the nutritionists that we've learned about the feed and, and uh, the genetics has just really changed in the last five years. Well, and another thing that's happened is, is because of the genetics, we're stacking them on top of each other, the good stuff on top of the good stuff. And if you take a look at, at Ohio's a really good example. Ohio, I mean, out in the wild in Ohio, I mean, yes, there are, there's a handful of big deer still killed every year, but it's just a handful compared to all the other ones. And the reason why is because of genetics and age. I mean, let's face it, as a farmer, what we want to do, whether you're growing tomatoes or white-tailed deer, doesn't matter, we want to grow our stuff healthy, big, and fast. That is true, that okay? is true. And that's, that's what farmers do, okay? And so I'm, I'm going, I'm looking at these deer and one and two year olds, I'm going, genetically, they've got what it takes because at three years old, they're gonna be, I mean, there's some of them here at two that are monstrous, but I look at the wild deer and I'm going, what happens is the hunting, trophy hunting out there in the wild, they, what do they do? They shoot the best genetics they can get. Absolutely. And, and, and it may be a one-year-old or two-year-old. And so what that does is it prevents those great genetics from passing on down the line. And if the hunter can't be disciplined enough to let those young deer walk and, and pass those genetics on throughout the, the, the herd, long-term, how are they gonna ever get anything big? We try to turn all of ours loose in the pasture at three years old. We raise them here for three year old. And if we happen to great, get a great one, then we bring him in for a breeder buck. But uh, most, 95% of these all goes to the pasture at three. Okay. So uh, these deer right here, you're gonna you hold on to them, and I mean, by the time they're three years old, you'll know whether you want to use from one for breeding or their their turnout deer. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if they're turnout deer and they're out there in the pasture and they have an opportunity to breed, they're still better than 99% of the genetics on the outside anywhere. That's true. Well, the genetics, it, it's all about genetics. I mean, yes, you. I mean, we know it's got to be nutrition, but it's got to be genetics, and then. I'm saying, you know, as a farmer, think about it, like I said, you want to grow them big and fast. And if we can do that, what happens, we're able to, to harvest our crop, whether it's tomatoes or deer, That's at right. an earlier age, That's because true. it's big. That is true. Wow, boy, those are some nice looking deer. All right, I want to go see some sunflowers. I'm gonna, I want to go see some sunflowers, and then I hear that you have the largest antler uh, chandelier in the world. I'm kind of proud of that. Well, we're going to have to see that too. <laughs> and then we'll come back and look at some deer later on. Oh, okay. The Deer Farming Channel is brought to you in part by New Dart, leading the industry in accuracy. We're only about, uh, well, we're less than an hour away from the Columbus, Ohio airport right here, out of a little town named West Liberty. And this is a beautiful piece of property. Uh, I, in, in driving in here today, I, I wound up, I, I started looking around, I started thinking, okay, that probably was good deer habitat at one time, and that was probably a good deer habitat at one time, but it's really not good deer habitat now because of man. Man came in here and built houses and roads and schools, and, 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 and I mean, hey, uh, man came and screwed up the native habitat for the white-tailed deer. 
And so when it comes to a piece of property like this, if somebody says enough is enough, enough madness, they put up a fence around it and they said this piece of property, we're gonna protect the habitat for not just the white-tailed deer, but for every wild animal that's living here, my hat's off to them. You know, you do have a different business model. You know, most deer farms that we go to wind up selling bucks, does, or fawns, and you sell none of the above. None, none. We don't have anything for sale. And that's that, and that is a different business model. But you do have does. But you told me yesterday you only have the number of does to do what? Just to restock what we got. You know, you're replacing does all time, and you know they get old and they, they pass on, and and we only get 20% does out of our breeding program. Mm-hmm. So. I mean, you have way more bucks and does, but you only have the amount of does to give you the number of bucks that you want down the road. That's true. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, that, like I said, that's a completely different business model. And, and the people want more information about your operation, how they get a hold of you. X Factor Whitetails of Ohio. And they can just get online, and then uh, if they want to give you a holler, they can get your phone number right off the site. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. good deal. You got some great deer, Russ. It's been a pleasure to be able to get to spend some one-on-one -on -one time with Russ Beller. He really is a staple in the deer farming community. And to be able to see some of the offspring that came out of the X-Factor bloodline is pretty impressive to say the least. If you have any questions or comments about today's show, let me hear from you. You can shoot me an email or get onto my Facebook page and post it right there. I promise you, we'll get right back to you. I'm Keith Warren and thanks for watching deer and wildlife stories. What you're about to see is graphic in nature, so viewer discretion is advised. Last August, many of Texas's deer farmers were forced to kill hundreds of perfectly healthy deer in order to test them for chronic wasting disease. To date, approximately 600 deer have been killed, and the killing isn't over. What's worse is that out of all the deer that were killed, not a single one of them tested positive for chronic wasting disease. I don't know about you, but to me there's just something wrong with the picture when you start killing perfectly healthy deer to test them to make sure they're not sick with chronic wasting disease. Now CWD has been around for over 50 years and I'm a believer that CWD, it needs to be managed uh, from science-based management rather than from a political agenda. And I think that we ought to learn from states that have been battling CWD for more than 50 years. And they themselves say that uh, there's nothing they can do to manage it, what they need to do is just monitor it. So again, I think that we ought to base our CWD stuff all on science and not on a political agenda. If you'd like to find out more about chronic wasting disease, let me encourage you to go to the website, cwdmyths.com.